one. Welcome. Okay, we I am going to get our guest Tim Dillinger. Let's see here. Hold for one sec here. Hope everyone's doing well. We are ready to go live with Mr. Tim Dillinger. Okay, I have so live. Hopefully he'll be joining any moment. Okay. I hope everyone's doing well. Oh my God. Here we are. <laughs> Hi. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. It's so good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me today. Of course. I hope I'm not too well, close and terrifying people. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know. I hope I'm not too close to that. I feel like I need to sit back a little bit or something like my head. Right. I just pushed off. the thing back a little bit. Okay, because, hold on here. Yeah. I know it's like whenever I like adjust something and then, okay, I'm just coming back a little further. I, okay, there we go. There we go. That's good. Okay. You're doing, you look great. I, I, I was oh, the yeah. one. I felt like when you I got on, great. I just felt like I was like that. So. <laughs> Well, I, as soon as I saw the top of my head cut off, I was just a little a little concerned. No, you look great, and I'm so glad we've got people. Um, I see Ra Roderick Atagi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Roderick Atagi just joined. I see um, Patsy. It, Pat Evil Taste Chalky just joined. Hey! Oh, thank you so much. She said we both look pretty. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here. There, there's so much to, to discuss. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and give you a proper intro before okay. we get started. I want to just welcome everybody to Frederick Johnson in Conversation. I'm your host, Frederick Johnson. And today, my guest is an award-winning singer, songwriter, producer, poet, speaker, and historian whose career has spanned over 20 years. His work has been featured in a number of national media platforms, ranging from NPR to Huffington Post to Color Lines Magazine. He hosted Out of the Box with Tim Dillinger for three seasons, where he interviewed cultural icons such as Nikki Giovanni, Jimmy Scott, Dorothy Norwood. That's just incredible. He has released five albums and two books. He earned his Bachelor in Arts in Africana Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies in 2018 from the State University of New York, University of Albany. He is a proud graduate school dropout. That's right. uh, he's hosts a monthly live series, Have You Ever Heard, which revisits lesser known albums by artists from the worlds of gospel, soul, contemporary Christian and women's music and writes weekly features for Substack mailing list, God's Music Is My Life. He's currently completing a book about the history of the New York Community Choir. We're gonna talk about all of that today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Dillinger. Hi, again, thank you. You it's are welcome. It's good to be here. It's good you're to be welcome. here. You're welcome. I am so glad you're here. And Tim, it's, uh, there's so much to cover, and I know Instagram only allows us like a, that tight hour so I'm just going to jump right in because I've got, there's so much to discuss. On uh, Congratulations, first off, on the Substack uh, newsletter, which is incredible. We're going to talk about that a lot more. Um, on the newsletter, you describe yourself when you're, you're stating who you are. One of the terms you use to describe yourself is a Pentecostal humanist. Yeah. And I would ask you, what is a Pentecostal humanist? Well, I, you know, I, as a person who grew up in the, holiness church you know i i came out of that experience forever changed in many ways in great ways but also i couldn't do all of the um rules and regulations and fundamentalism and all the stuff that comes with it and so when i left i really was uh seeking ways to keep uh the ecstasy of that experience in my life because that was the part that I really really loved that we could come together and sing and raise a song and change the room and our all of our respective weeks we could leave and and go out encouraged and yeah. motivated and change to see things through through a new lens yes and I thought god that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't God doing that. That was us. That was our energy. Our energy is coming together yes. in shared experience, in shared knowledge, and enlightening each other and yes. moving each other. We did that. And I thought, I'm still Pentecostal, but I'm a humanist because I believe yeah. that's our energy. That's our power. Yes, that's, that's the humanism. That's right. Yeah. Now, I know you started singing as a child in church. I read that you debuted singing in church at the age of three. Yeah. Um, 
and you stood on top of a Folgers coffee can. So yeah. that way you could be visible over the podium. Back so, when they sold them in, in the tins that were strong enough to support little bodies. Right, you know? exactly. <laughs> those huge tins, those big tins yep. yeah, that were like, like that, exactly. Yep. So I, I know church was a very, very uh, big part of your childhood. So can you talk a little bit about that, especially in terms of you becoming a singer and in terms of music in general, you know, music you were exposed to, music you weren't? Well, music was just from my, my earliest memory is music. The first thing I remember hearing uh, was Reba Rambo uh, on the radio and telling my grandparents to take me to the Bible bookstore and buy me a record by Reba Rambo because it was that kind of transformational experience for me mm. at, you know, three years old. And I wanted to sing. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to make sound. And I started doing that. Um, and, you know, I had grandparents who were preaching, you know, as a pastor and I had the the ability to do that because I had a platform. So yeah. I didn't have to <laughs> I didn't have to audition or any of those things. I just had a built-in thing. You know, I wanted to sing and I did it all the time. I was on television the first time, second grade, singing wow. on local Christian television. But it, you know, I so I really didn't know for the front end of my life anything else that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. That was really it. I was consumed with music and learning songs and lyrics and understanding how those songs were put together. I was really, uh, my mother taught me to read really young. I had a librarian mother who taught me to read. I went into kindergarten already knowing how to read. Mm -hmm. And so I was really looking at songs and words just were like big travelogues to me. I mean, I, words took me places. And yes. so I was reading books and books and music were just my escape from the fundamentalism. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was all around me. So yeah. uh, I think I answered your question. Music was yeah. really it. Yeah. Now, now, as a teenager, I know that you found a new church home, which which yeah. kind of afforded a whole new music experience and a whole new life experience. Whole new life experience. How did you come to get to the new church home? And then what exactly was that new experience? Honestly, they they found me. And that was the most mm -hmm. amazing thing I was. 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, getting asked to sing in different churches because I had done Christian television. I was in like a little circle. And thankfully, I had a really supportive mom who would take me to all of these places because they would just, you know, I'd meet somebody at a church singing and they'd say, hey, give me your number. I go to such and such a church and we'd like love to have you there. And so a church, New Covenant Holiness Church, uh, when I was just a, in my early teens, found me. Uh, one of those services and mm. I it was a you know transcendent kind of experience I don't mean to make it sound so dramatic but walking up the steps to that church I was 14 years old and I just knew I had found some place that was going to change my life mm. I remember what before the service had even started I was walking up those steps and I just went this is home this mm. is home and sure enough when we when the service started I was just completely blown away by the spirit that was there. And so that was a, a, a black Pentecostal holiness. We were fire baptized. Uh, we were for real, for real mm -hmm. holiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started sneaking out of my grandparents' church. <laughs> and I, I had always had older friends. And so I'd say, hey, can you pick me up at the corner where my <laughs> grandparents' church is? And I would do my duty and sing and sneak out the back door and yeah. get to New Covenant and yeah. figure out how to get home later. I love and that. So your double life was going to another church. Totally. <laughs> totally. And I did that. Uh, and then finally, I, my mother said, okay, we have to do something about this because it's really clear this isn't where you want to be. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, my whole life changed because it wasn't just about going to church. It was about being in a new community, yeah. learning about a whole other culture, uh, understanding. I mean, you know, at 14, 15, really getting into um, Black culture, Black people's lives. Yeah. And uh, it shifted how I viewed the world. And, and thank God, because, uh, you know, I see where a lot of um, people are in the world today. Mm -hmm. And I go, mm -hmm. I wish they'd had that experience at 13 or 14, because mm -hmm. they might not see the world through the lens that they do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm grateful for that experience, because it 
completely changed the trajectory of my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I know at 18, I think it was that you actually started performing and traveling with like famed gospel artist Beverly mm -hmm. Crawford. Did you meet her at that church? How did you come to meet Beverly Crawford? No, I was a, a obs <laughs> obsessive um, Bobby Jump, New Life. I really loved the New Life singers, his group. And back then it was Beverly Crawford, Nuana Dunlap, Emily Harris, uh, Francine Belcher, and I think I said Beverly. Mm -hmm. Beverly, Nuana, Francine, Emily, and Angie Prim. And... Uh, Flew to Nashville. I graduated from high school when I was 17, and my godmother and I uh, flew to Nashville for the gospel explosion. And we're sitting in the back of Tennessee Performing Arts Center, and she said, There go your girl. There go your girl. There's Beverly. And Beverly was like, you know, dressed down. You know, she wasn't on stage. She had glasses on. I'd never seen her with glasses on. Yeah. And uh, I said, Who? And she said, That's Beverly. And I looked, and it was. And she just said, honey, come over here, honey. My godmother, she said, he draw, dragged us all the way to Nashville to see you. Come over here and say hello. And uh, Beverly came over and she, we, I met her husband uh, that, that, I think that same day. And we exchanged information and I just said, you know, we want to bring you to our church, do a revival. And um, we did and our spirits just clicked. And mm. so whenever they came to Florida, they would call me and say, hey, can you come up to Tallahassee? We're going to do a revival. We're in, wow. you know, Pompano Beach. Can you come and, and sing a song or two? And so I did that. And that was my early, uh, that was my first real experience on not just the kind of gospel highway I'd been on with my godmother and our church choir, uh, where we, you know, did the conference. This was like bonafide. I was getting real experience with a professional. Right. Um, and she, you know, she was, she and her husband were amazing. She's today, she's, a, she's a legend. Back then she yeah. was, her first record wasn't even out yet. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Because we know her as a legendary gospel artist now. Yeah. And in fact, Taylor Made World just made a comment. The late Emily Harris was a oh. dear my hashtag Kojic. Love that. Emily is God, I miss Emily. I didn't know Emily. Emily was the one. But so when I came to Nashville, I started meeting like Angie and Nuwana. When I moved to Nashville years later, uh, they became Nuwana in particular. When I first moved here, we would go in her garage and record uh, songs she was working on and demos. And the new life was just critical for me. And mm -hmm. there's nothing like this. And Emily Harris really was uh, definite. She was the definitive part of the new life sound that mm -hmm. Mm. nobody sang like Emily and she had stage presence. She was a star mm -hmm. and uh, one of the greats, one of the greats. Now, Tim, along with Beverly Crawford, I knew you also uh, worked with and performed with Daryl Coley. Um, Todd Vega, who Todd really has been since the color purple soundtrack. I mean, to me, Todd Vega made the color purple soundtrack. Oh. And, that, and, and for those who may be watching that don't know, you know her. If you've seen the color purple, you know Tata Vega. She was the singing voice of the character Shug right. Avery, played by Margaret Avery. God right. is trying to tell you something. Um, right. Sister, all of it. And yeah, so she's just, I mean, she's incredible. And also, and also uh, Reba Rambo. So I want to ask you, because when you were a kid, this was the artist who at three years old, you said... I, I, you, I, you were resonating with Reba Rambo then. Yeah. So like, what was that like to later meet her and then you end up performing with her? And well, working it's, with her? it's been a, ble I mean, it's, she's my godmother, you know, today, today, you know, we, we, as adults, uh, you know, young, no, 18 when I met her. Okay. Um, okay. We, we just had a spirit connection and yeah. that's been the real gift of being able to um, go out and meet Really, all of, everybody I've met, for the most part, it's been by chance. It's been yeah. by, you know, by chance. I put that in quotes because I always yes. believe spirit is connecting us. But it wasn't uh, Tata. I didn't seek that out. I met her sister. Okay. I met her sister, and her sister said, you need to know Tata, and <laughs> put us together. I mean, it was those kinds of encounters. Daryl Coley, I met through Nuana, yeah. ultimately, okay. and Tata. I mean, wow. it was these other things that were happening that connected me and then you know spirits click and yes uh, when i was working on my second record daryl uh, 
happily said, I'll come and do this song with you. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't believe it. Daryl, when I was a teenager, Daryl Coley and Vanessa Bell Armstrong, I played their records just when I slept, because I just said, I want to get all of this in my yeah. subconscious, all of it, <laughs> all of it. Let me listen while I'm sleeping and maybe it'll sink in. And uh, Daryl was, I mean, I miss Daryl every day. He was a yeah. jewel. He was a jewel. He was just a great yeah. human. People talk about his voice, but he was an amazing human being. So Daryl worked on your second album, The Muse. Yeah. So I know you went on to have your, your solo recording career, um, Love Is On My Mind, The Muse, yeah. The Gospel EP, The Baton 1985. You also had a remixes album. Um, so okay. Specifically on The Muse, though, I think on, it was on The Muse that there was a, it's a segue. It is... I wrote this note because I didn't want to forget it. It is, um, no, it was on Love Is On My Mind, Till The Six Is Nine. <laughs> so I've yeah. basically, this whole past week, I've just been living with your your music, Tim, which is- Oh, bless your heart. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I've been listening to everything. And when I was hearing Love Is On My, when I heard Till The Six Is Nine, you, there's a segue of it that you call, uh, uh, refer to as a tone poem. And there's only one place I've ever heard reference of a tone poem, and that was Ivory on the yeah. Tina Marie album. And there was yeah. Ivory, a tone poem. So I had to ask, I was like, was that a deliberate Tina Marie totally. reference? And if so, totally. why? Well, and she was, I mean, if I think about a trinity of artists, Tina would be one of the three okay. that most just, if, you know, most of my heroes were gospel singers, but Tina showed me how to put the spirit and the body together yeah. because she was, you know, she sang about love, but it was also spiritual. And yeah. so she was that flip side of what you didn't get in church because Tina was also like completely in contact with her body. Yeah. And, you know, being in love was critical to her. And so it raised, she always raised sexuality for me, which of course we did not get in church. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she saw me, she helped me really figure out how to integrate myself as a human being. Yeah. Well, and that's what I heard, especially I was listening to everything in chronological uh, order. Like I just mm -hmm. started with the first time. And like what I kept continuing to hear was just kind of a greater, more and more of you, like coming mm -hmm. out in the music. And you're touching on, you're talking about love, especially on the first album, you're talking about love, but then you're also talking about race. You're talking about spirituality. You're talking about, it's definitely, it's contemporary gospel. It's R&B. There's jazz. You've got spoken confused word. confused everyone. And in, right? well, that's what I was about to say. How was this, because you were a gospel artist, so was there, what was there kind of like a personal reconciliation that happened for you with, with the music that you were creating? And what did that look like? When I was making my first record, I was really a response to leaving the church uh, because I just had moved to Nashville and really thought I was going to be a gospel artist. And I got here and I just couldn't do it. <laughs> I just could not um, chop off pieces of myself to be a gospel artist. And I knew that talking about politics was important to me. I knew that talking about race was important to me. I knew that talking about sexuality was important, even though I was not publicly out at that point. I knew that at some point that was going to happen. And so I knew that I couldn't set up a life for myself that was dependent on me being a particular kind of person mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that would then be ripped away. It still kind of happened that way. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I knew I couldn't set my artistry up on that. And so Love Is yeah. On My Mind was me really as a 27 year old, 26 when I wrote it, trying to make this first statement, you know, about who I was and what was important to me. Yeah. I retrospectively at 40, you know, going on 46, I'm pretty proud of how that kid saw the little grain of who he was. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a great start. Uh, but when you start selling music, things get muddy. Yeah. And so you go into it thinking you're not going to be chopping pieces off of yourself off. Yeah. And then and you start realizing people expect you to be what they want you to be. And so that's yeah. when you hear my body of work, it is me 
really resisting, trying to resist that notion. Right, right. And, and even if it did, as you say, even if it did kind of get ripped apart, in whatever way that may have happened, I get what you're saying. It was kind of on, it was actually, it happened on your terms. It happened on exactly. your terms as the way you set it up. So, and you, and you knew what all, you know, you knew the environment that you were in. Um, yep. The Bataan 1985, uh, which, which is such a fun record. And, and when I got to that album, it's like so different than everything you had recorded beforehand. Yep. Um, I love, I think the song was, I think it's Threshing Floor. Mm hmm I love that. I We're love getting ready to put that back out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's it's a great song. And so, um, but I want you to talk about the significance of the year nineteen eighty five because there's there there's uh, and as people explore other work that you do when you talk about, especially when you talk about the contemporary Christian music, but yeah. talk a little bit about like kind of why you named it that the baton nineteen eighty five. Well, 1985 to me was, for me, I was 10 years old in 1985. And that was just the greatest, everybody says this, I'm sure about some year when they were yeah. growing up. But for me, it was the central year of when gospel music, timber Christian music, R&B, uh, you know, pop. It was, there was an interconnectedness between yeah. all of those genres. Things were not as segmented as they are now. And... For me, I just remember the joy of every record I listened to that year. I mean, every record. Yeah. It was a good year. It was a great year. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, it was uh, Amy Grant Unguarded, Tremaine Hawkins, The Search is Over, um, Rust Half Metals, um, and 86, too. I mean, so there's just this chain of records that don't seem like they're connected, but they are. Yeah. And so when I was making the Baton 1985, and really the title, uh, I owe that title to Be Slayed because we had written a song called The Baton together. And then my husband and I, Ray, had written a song called 1985. Okay. And when Be Slayed and I were working out the album, he said, well, your title is The Baton 1985. You know, like Rhythm Nation, you know. <laughs> And, 1814. Right. Yeah. And I went, oh, yeah, it's a really good idea. I would have never thought of it. And so that's where the fusing of those two things, because he said, that's the year you're trying to take people back to. Yeah. You're wanting people to remember and feel a little bit of what you felt that year. And so that whole record was about trying to recreate, um, in some sense, a nostalgia, but also a looking forward. Yeah. Like, what is it that we need to pull from that era? and yeah. bring into how we're creating today. It's really for artists. That record is really for artists. Yeah, well, it's, I, I thought it was great. And it was, Thank and you. it was, you know, it, it, it was great. The song, I mean, the songs were good, especially there was another track I love to, um, oh God, I, oh, The Baton, which closes, oh. I think closes, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, it's, it is an incredible, like, epic anthem it is. gospel. It's Be beautiful. Slayed. Yeah. He slayed. Get, he laid the foundation for that. He had the chorus. I wrote the verses. Um, but B. Slade brought that to the table, called me. Uh, I was in Nashville. I had just moved back to Nashville and said, um, I've got a song for you. This one is for you. Mm -hmm. You're the one that's supposed to sing it. And he said, it's a James Cleveland sample, so you better bring it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and we went up there and we did that. And really that vocal, we did that in one. That was one take. Really. Wow. That was one take. Wow. And it was just one of those, it's a moment I'll never forget. Yeah. Because the spirits were just there. And I just got the yeah. little chill bumps thinking about it. Uh, okay. It was a great moment. And, and really, he created that um, mm. for me. And I'll always be grateful for that. Mm -hmm. He's an amazing, amazing producer with a great, he's intuitive in a way that most people aren't. Like they listen mm. to you and they think they can formulate what will fit you, but be slayed spiritually. He knew. Yeah, he knew yeah. what I needed and he knew I mm -hmm. needed that mm -hmm. James Cleveland, Davis sisters mm -hmm. kind of bed mm -hmm. with a contemporary gloss on top mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And it was just everything my spirit needed. Wonderful, wonderful. And yeah. just for any of those who are who are in the room with this that aren't familiar with it, I'm going to put links in, in the final post of the interview where all of that can be found, including the baton. Uh, the, this radio show, Out of the Box, that you hosted for three seasons, I was just amazed by the folks that you had conversations with. I mean, just, uh, me I mean, Nikki, I mean, even if you, even if the only person you ever interviewed with Nikki Giovanni, that, that would have been 
sufficient. Um, she's such an icon that just needs yeah. no definition at all. What did you learn from Nikki Giovanni? Oh, well, I learned Nikki was that really, I, I see what, I know what Tina pulled from her, Tina Marie, mm -hmm. because Nikki, Nikki is also- Nikki Giovanni, just the name, a few. Yeah, but- Exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Nikki is also body and spirit. Mm -hmm. And so I'm reading Nikki's book. I mean, when I was uh, in my early 20s, I mean, Cotton Candy on a Rainy Day was just one of my favorite mm -hmm. collections of poems, still is. Um, and I just learned so much from her about looking uh, as a writer mm -hmm. that your everyday experience and finding the profound in it, because I don't think she was sitting down trying to just write profound mm -hmm. shit mm -hmm. every day, you know, excuse me. <laughs> right. But she was, she was with her keen eye, mm -hmm. just picking out all of those jewels in the mundane. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think about this little letter that, you know, we're getting ready to put on the front of the house. Mm -hmm. And I think about, you know, looking at that and mm -hmm. finding what's significant about it. Yeah. And that's what I learned from Nikki Giovanni, mm -hmm. just the everyday things, finding the profound. Mm -hmm. a another guest that I read that you interviewed, and I think it's who I think it is, Jimmy Scott. Is this the jazz singer form? Yeah. It used to be called Lil Jimmy Scott. What do you got? Yep. That, okay, wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, just, so what was it like conversing with Jimmy Scott. Oh, I, I well, I'm I was starstruck because yeah. Jimmy Scott is I mean, if and many people don't know who he is yeah. because he's that kind of like if you know, you really know. Yeah. And if you don't, you're just like, who's that? Go look up Jimmy Scott. Yeah. I mean, he is the 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 really Nancy Wilson has said her entire sound was pulled yes. from emulating Jimmy Scott yes. ultimately. Yes. And I mean, he was that kind of legend. He was just so down to earth. He was yeah. so just thrilled to talk about his story and share his experience. And uh, we talked about um, song selection. We talked about musicianship, um, traveling. You know, at that point, he was still touring. He was mm -hmm. not, uh, he was, I mean, he stayed on the road, I mean, through his 80s. I mean, yeah. He had a whole resurgence around that. I, I remember, I think, one of those albums, I think it was Dream, mm -hmm. um, which was just phenomenal. That was huge. That was huge. And then that was kind of another resurgence. And he was, I, I think he might have been 70s, 80s, something then. Yeah. That was a whole other era of him going on the road and, and performing. That's right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. He didn't reemerge until the late eighties and he got that deal with Sire Records. Mm. Um and uh that all the way record was the big the comeback way. record. Yes. That album yeah. is exquisite. Yeah. And if you have again, if you have not heard Jimmy Scott, start with All the Way and work your way back and okay. then go forward. Yeah. Because Jimmy was just he was just a peerless interpreter. Yeah. And that voice, that haunting, the fascinating, haunting. brilliant voice. So you had another series, or have have the other series? Um, um, have you ever heard um, yeah. the web series? And how did that come about? Talk about that show. Well, thank you, coronavirus. That's really how that <laughs> happened. <laughs> because we were sitting home, and you know, we were right before COVID hit. My husband and I were about to have our first, you know, house concert here, like the first music we've really done in the world in like eight years, and. We had scheduled the whole bit and then COVID hit. And I said, oh, we're going to cancel that puppy because nobody's coming up in here. Uh, <laughs> and we so you know, so we set about finding alternative ways to create. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is a great time to to point people's attention for the, you know, the people that are interested in what I do, mm -hmm. pointing people to other artists, you know, formative mm -hmm that have done formative works that don't really get a lot of attention or as much attention as I think they should. Um, and so I just set about talking about, uh, initially just was gonna talk about a couple of records. I didn't think it was gonna be this thing that would go on for I think 12 episodes we did, but mm -hmm. um, it was so much fun because uh, we did it live, which is a whole different kind of pressure. And so when I, I have filmed the second season, and we did we will not be doing it live um but it was a lot of fun and i felt like we just had great particularly patsy moore and i had a great conversation mm -hmm. about her last record 
Um, my friend Kyla Jade came on and we talked about Bobby Jones and New Life, Bring mm -hmm, It to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talking about this diverse range of works. And again, I think the whole theme of my whatever I do is about making people view things as more connected or trying yeah. to help people see things as more connected yeah. um, rather than chopped off. I, I don't like being yeah. chopped off. No, in the show, there were a couple of artists I wasn't familiar with. I mean, you've exposed me to so much. And, and specifically in that show, there were a couple of artists that were part of a genre referred to as women's music. And oh, yeah. I know as a historian that your work is really looking particularly at contemporary Christian, gospel, and women's music. And I wanted you to talk about um, like how you came to discover mu women's music and what the significance of that genre is for you. Well, again, women's music kind of landed in my lap. Um, 2012, I was, um, without going into the whole story, I was hospitalized, almost died. I was in bed for five months that year, recuperating. I saw a documentary in that time called Radical Harmonies. And, you know, I was on prednisone and awake like 23 hours a day and not sleeping a lot. And, and so I saw this documentary and I was completely blown away because the only group I was aware of that was in the documentary was Sweet Honey and the Rock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were a part of women's music, but also like other forms of music. They were interconnected. And so uh, I found this, you know, treasure chest of artists, Meg Christian, um, Linda Tillery, Gwen Avery, um, Chris, did I say Chris Williamson, Meg Christian, mm. um, Holly Near. These were incredibly um, politically minded, feminist minded, um, uh, uh, politically in the sense of like world politics, not just United States politics. Mm -hmm. They really had a global view of the world. And I was blown away by the sound. And so when you've got women's music was really born out of what they call lesbian feminism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so these were women who were not writing about relationships from a patriarchal lens. They were not interested in selling to men. And so it created this whole other window because all of these concerns we think about when we're making music were completely not present because mm. they were operating from a completely different framework. And it mm -hmm. reminded me when I heard it, because the music was multiple genres. It's not like they were all just strumming their little folk guitars. I mean, Linda Tillery, Gwen Avery, these were, you know, soul and gospel rooted artists. And mm -hmm. so they were taking their sound, fusing it with this woman centered music. And, you know, they, it was what reminded me of contemporary Christian music. Mm. Mm -hmm. because it's more of a, an ideological um, definition of the music mm -hmm. than a style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's message-based, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that the songs are coming from a feminist lens mm -hmm. um, is what makes it women's music, that it is women writing for and about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was completely just gobsmacked by it. And as somebody that had attempted in my own music to write um, non-gendered music, because I wanted my music to be able to um, reach people who weren't like me and for people who are like me, because mm -hmm. I thought nobody's writing music for gay people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, when I hear all these songs on the radio, nobody's concerned about how I hear it. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Right. And so for women's music to be writing for themselves, it was yeah. just such a complete um, paradigm shifter for yeah. me. And I just became obsessed with it and started buying it. Every time I saw a, a used record store, I would go look in the folk <laughs> section because that's usually where they put it because they didn't okay. know where else to put it. And I would buy up the you know women's music records and it became just a part of me and, and then started going to a lot of the concerts when we could so we mm -hmm. you know gotten to see Lynn, uh, um, Chris Williamson and Holly Near, um, Tret Fury multiple times and just understanding more about how that culture has now for 45 years mm. survived. And I think did the, the, the Michigan Women's Festival I think was kind of right. like a definitive Totally. That, it was a yeah. major part of that. Yeah. And um, 
you know, are, and again, artists like Sweet Honey and the Rock, they still utilize Goldenrod, which was the, the women's distribution channel. I mean, these mm. women had created an entire separate aspect of the music industry. They yeah. distributed their own records. They had their own bookstores. They had their own yeah. outlets. They had their yeah. own radio shows. Yeah, thought, it's interesting. It was that, kind yeah. of like they were defying the paradigm. Oh. And, and just do, creating their own channels and yeah. creating their own, yeah. 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 So selling out Carnegie Hall. Right, right. You know, so yeah. it's, it was an amazing uh, section. And so when I got into academia, when I went back to school, I just thought, sure, this had already really been tackled, you know, by mm -hmm. um, theorists and really, I mean, there's very little scholarship about it. Wow. Um, Bonnie Morris has done probably the most work and she's done amazing, amazing work. And, uh, but be, you know, you find an article here and there, but in mm -hmm. terms of it being like a, a specific focus, and I thought, we're not really focusing on music, which is what mm -hmm. I also, you know, I'm so thrilled now to see all these books on gospel music coming out yeah. of academia, uh, finally. You know, yeah. it's because a lot of what's been written about gospel is operated outside of there and we're losing histories. Yeah. You know, people are, I hate to say it, people are dying. Yeah. You know, they're, they're taking those histories with them oftentimes. Yes. And I know um, with the new newsletter, um, congrats again, uh, God's yeah. Music is My Life, that this is, this is one of, at least I feel like as a reader, it's kind of like this is one of those places where you're keeping the, the the annals you're keeping the history you know yes. alive there i wanted to ask you how did you come to title the newsletter god's music is my life well there was a uh, gospel artist uh from new york who i actually did a lot of my undergraduate research on benny cummings and the king's temple choir uh, and they were out of long island and their first album in i believe 1972 was um called God's Music Is My Life. And so when we were thinking through, I'm awful at naming things, just awful at it, I hate it. Um, and I pulled out that album and I thought, this is really it. I mean, I thought about the trajectory of what my life has been. Mm -hmm. And in some way I've always been collecting histories and I've always been even, you know, in just friendships, not formally taping interviews with people, but having conversations with people and finding out about the past, you know, we become containers uh, for those stories. You yeah. know, when people share them with us, they're ours to think about and formulate yeah. and carry on in some sense. And so that's how it got named was Benny Cummings and King's Temple Choir. Well, this week is your fourth issue. I, I believe I think your your first was about the contemporary Christian artist Terry Desario. Yeah. Week two was um, Amy Grant and the landmark uh, Unguarded. Yes. Uh, week three was the New York Community Choir, which we're we're going to go back to that. Okay. Um, and this week is the incredible story of uh, Tremaine Hawkins, and specifically. Uh, one particular album, which I'd love for you, you know, of course, we're also going to have the link to Substack as well. So what we want everyone to go out and subscribe to God's Music is My Life. Um, but this week's this week's issue about Tremaine Hawkins, just talk to us a little bit about that and the significance of her, not only in gospel, um, and particularly this one project that was kind of a lightning rod, but also just significance yeah. for you personally. Well, Tremaine has been in my life my whole life, you know, mm -hmm. Musically, I don't mean like I know her, but I mean, yeah. her music has been in my life as early as I can remember. My mom bought, had all those Love Alive, Walter Hawkins records that she led, you know, songs on and um, her solo records. And so when The Search is Over came out in 1986, um, it was just one of those albums that was just never left, I mean, into the 90s. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was a regular rotation for me still is today. Yeah. So I mean, Tremaine's just through my entire I mean, I think about, you know, my early uh, courtship with my husband, one of the first things we sat and watched together was Tremaine singing changed. I mean, I'll just, yeah. you know, so she's just woven yeah. in our story. Um, yeah. But the search is over was really controversial and yeah. an album i always get intrigued by things that are controversial and when people move on and don't want to talk about things yeah and i and you know it's funny i remember i was in high school when that came out 
I think I might have been in like 10th grade or something. And I do remember, and I wasn't listening to gospel, but it was such a success. And it was such yeah. kind of like coming, crossing over, quote unquote, yeah. in these other arenas. And I remember kind of hearing the backlash, like the yes. back, you know. Um, and yeah, so she, that that was, and you said that it's, especially when people don't want to talk about these things moving forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When because it's certain as I started really digging into the story way back when I was in in college, because of course I remembered, um, I knew the album when it came out. I did not know it had been such a firestorm of kind. I had no idea the extent to which she was really vilified. Um, so when I started reading, going back and reading like old Billboard articles, and you know even her A and M executive wrote an editorial uh, in Billboard really defending her uh, and what they were trying to do for gospel music uh, by taking Fall Down into the clubs and mainstreaming gospel is how they saw it, not about um, crossing it over or lightening the message. They saw it as making gospel music on par with pop music. Yeah. Saying there's a place within pop music for this music to also exist and be a consistent presence. Yes. And, you know, church people don't like that because... Yeah. I believe it's economic. <laughs> In many ways, I believe, you know, churches are dependent on people coming. And a big selling point for churches is their music. And if people start hearing gospel music everywhere, why would I need to go to church and put money so, in the pocket? Now, that's interesting. I've never thought of it from that perspective or heard that perspective. So it's not just solely about you shouldn't be singing that music in a non-church atmosphere. What you're, what you're saying is, is that there's a component to it that, oh, people may not come because if they're hearing it somewhere else, they don't need to come here, which means they won't contribute yep. financially here. That's what I believe. Okay. That's what I believe. Yeah. I could be completely wrong and it could be completely su uh, subconscious. It may not <laughs> even be anything people are cognizant of, but I really just cannot believe that there is anything uh, you know look people love to be in a club yeah and by, by club i mean the country yeah. club they yeah. love to believe they corner the market on something yeah and there's always a thrill when we get to keep other people out right right and i'm not and, saying i feel that way i'm saying yeah <laughs> you know Taylor made right. world just said the Clark sisters went through that with uh, you brought the sunshine. Yeah, for another great example. I mean, and the Clark sisters didn't even do what Tremaine did. Tremaine, I love that Tremaine went to uh, Paradise, Paradise Garage. Paradise Garage herself. Yeah. The I Clark, mean, they invited yeah. the Clark sisters. They said, "No, thank you. We won't be doing that because they got enough trouble just for their song being played yeah. there." I mean, it's but, it's. You it's know what's funny? This there was a song that came out a few years ago. It was a BB Winans song featuring the Clark sisters, and there mm -hmm. was a remix by Louis Vega. I think it was yes. called Dance. It was called Dance, and I remember seeing on YouTube they went to a, a they went to a gay club in New York and did oh, I love it. It's, yeah, that was on YouTube, and not, not all of them. It was BB, Karen, and her daughter. I think it was the oh, three of it. them. Yeah, and they went to, you know, some place that would have been very similar to Paradise yeah. Garage, you know, yeah. back in the day. So, but yeah, and one of you, there was an interesting quote in, in the piece uh, from one of um, the producers uh, for Tremaine's album, I, uh, producer is uh, Wright, Mr. Mm -hmm. Wright. Robert and Wright, there was that yeah. quote, he said, if we're fishers of men, you can't just fish in a Christian pond. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. And that was relayed to me by Loris Holland, who worked on that album as well and co-produced uh, other songs on that record with Robert Wright. Uh, Robert Wright transitioned in, in 86. Mm -hmm. um, so I really was grateful for Loris in particular, um, sharing a lot of Robert's, you know, the conversations they had. Uh, because, and that's ultimately, really, it's why we see all of these forms of Christian music uh, whether it's gospel or CCM, they are getting smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of their market hold. And the reason is because the music is becoming more and more exclusionary. Mm, mm -hmm. And in the 80s, the reason they were selling so many records was because they were trying to reach out and they were trying to include uh, people in a di very, an extremely different kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, ultimately, I mean, my real fear is that they're going to kill 
what could be great music uh, by, you know, being so exclusionary. Buying so being so exclusionary, writing songs like this worship music that really like who resonates with that? They don't even know what that language means. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. out in the world talking about the glory, you know, soaking in the glory and these soak songs and all this stuff. People don't know what that is. They don't have any mm -hmm. relationship with what that is. People mm -hmm. know spirit fall down. They know what that yeah. means. They can connect yeah. with that. You know, yeah. love will find a way. We can connect with that. Yeah. This other stuff, just like Harry Potter land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Now, going back um, to New York Community Choir, which which yeah. has kind of their own version of this mm -hmm. type of story, um, you your forthcoming book is about mm -hmm. the New York Community Choir. So yeah. why did you choose them as a subject matter for your book? I fell in love with them. They just, I, I, um, Daryl Coley turned me on to them, actually, because I was a few years too late to have heard them in their heyday. Okay. And so by the time I was coming of age in the 80s, they, were, they weren't even together anymore. In 2012, uh, Daryl Coley, uh, he would always, we would talk and talk about music, and he'd say, you ever heard such and such? And one day he said, you know, you need to, have you ever heard the New York Community Choir? Isaac Douglas and the New York Community Choir. And I said, no. And he said, oh, boo, you need to go find their records. <laughs> and I went out and he told me some great stories about meeting Isaac Douglas at Doss Music Workshop of America when he was a teenager and just, you know, great, great stories of, of the choir and Isaac. And so I got the first thing I remember hearing, it may not be the first thing I actually heard, but the first thing I remember hearing was a song called Let's Go Higher. Mm -hmm. And they turned me out. I heard that oh. song and I said, oh, these people are free in a different kind of way. And I didn't know what that meant, but I heard Arthur Freeman singing that lead vocal and the choir just cutting up in the studio, which you don't get on a lot of studio records. Yeah. You know, and I heard that and I said, oh, they're different. They're, they're something different about them. I want to know their story. They just grabbed me. I wasn't in school yet, didn't know anything, didn't know I was going to do that. So when I went back to college two years later, and I knew I was going to try to get into a graduate program upon finishing, I said, well, I'm going to have to write a senior thesis. And I thought, I'm going to find their story. Mm. And find out what their story is. And so I found first person I interviewed for that thesis was Nikki Giovanni. Oh, wow. Um, who had recorded two records with them in 72 and 73 and toured with them for years. Mm. They were her, mm. you know, she called them her choir. Yeah. Um, and uh, I interviewed her. Then I met Benny Diggs, who uh, was one of the co-founders of the group. And Benny was just incredibly open from the very beginning, our first conversation. And uh, I started finding uh, through Benny and just through my own research, other people who had been in the choir and musicians that had worked, you know, in the choir and with the choir. And here I am <laughs> eight years, what, six years later uh, and still working on it. Um, they're just, a, their mission was completely different than anybody I've ever met in gospel mm -hmm. music. Um, they came from the spiritual church, which is a whole different thing. And so they had a different openness about sexuality, about being out in the world and what that meant, where they could go in the world, what they could have. Um, because as a choir, Tim, weren't they also going to a lot of like non-traditional spaces? Yeah, they went to, they, they performed at a, um, uh, the Loft, you know, David Mancuso's uh, club. And, you know, they had already gotten so much trouble just for performing with Nikki Giovanni yeah, and doing right. all the stuff they did yeah. in the Black Arts Movement. I mean, that yeah. was just completely unacceptable to churches. And I was going to say, world. even there was almost kind of like a socio-political component to that, totally. that the church was not supportive of. Totally. Right. Yeah. And they're, I mean, they were just they're thinkers. I mean, they're, you know, and that's partially from their own, you know, nature, you know, their own, uh, um, yeah, their own nature as individuals, but also the spiritual church, you know, particularly at that time was just 
New thought. And what is this, like, what is the spiritual church or when they were talking about the spiritual church, what did that mean? And how was that different in terms of? Well, the spiritual church often gets really, they have such a really uh, harried reputation, if you will, because they get associated with in people's minds, you know, I don't know how else to say it. People accuse them of being involved with witchcraft. They accuse them oh, of, okay. because there's a there's an other world component, or there was. It's I don't hear so much about it in the contemporary spiritual church, but at the time, like it was not unusual for spiritual churches to have seances and to connect mm -hmm. with, you know, people that were no longer physically living, mm -hmm. um, and so all of that to them was very ordinary. And so that's a whole different way of operating in the world. And so having those conversations with them really helped me understand how they, I mean, really as horribly as they were talked about, didn't phase them right. <laughs> at all. They were just like, it's, it's really what uh, um, uh, Robert Wright uh, said to Tremaine, you know, yeah. it, not everybody's going to go where you go, you're going to go. Yeah. And they were just very clear about what their mission was and yeah. what they wanted to be and do in the world. And they wanted to go uh, as far as they could go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were just there. So that's what really pulled me into their story, just their amazing um, outlook on life. And they're in there, uh, Arthur Freeman, uh, one of the other co-founders, he died last year, but mm. Benny Diggs, you know, 80 and going wow. strong and wow. still just full of thought. I mean, and, and producing and, you know, promoting and creating still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that's how I want to be. Yeah. You well, know, we so are, they, they people... sucked me in. Yeah. No, it sounds like it. It sounds like it. Well, no, this is awesome. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to the book. And that's last week's issue for all of the folks that after this is over, will go to the Substack link that will subscribe for the newsletter. You can read more about the New York Community Choir in last week's issue. That's so right. what's coming up? If, can you talk about what's coming up on the newsletter without going into too much detail? No spoiler um, respect. I'm working on right now a piece on Meg Christian from the women's okay. music world. And uh, uh, probably in three weeks, because I'm going to I'm going to take one week off. Um, so we're doing some recording. Um, and then I'll return with a piece on Tina Marie's Emerald oh, wow. City. Wow. Emerald which, City. Yes. Which I did on uh, last season of Have You Ever Heard. Yes. So I'm trying to pull those up uh, yeah. and point people back to that season. And then uh, we'll probably close out the month with the first new Have You Ever Heard with the... Um, had a little reunion of the 21st Century Singers, a gospel group based in Nashville. Um, and we did a um, reunion with the wow. four members who recorded an album called Sunday Night Fever. If that mm. gives you a little idea of what they were trying to cash in yeah. on. Uh, yeah. And so I interviewed them about that record. But I'm working on an essay about that album as well. So Awesome. We've got exciting stuff coming. I think. Oh, wait, that's great. Tim, that is wonderful. And we, we, I cannot believe we're already down to our last few minutes. We are. Yeah, we're already down to like, I think we've got like six or seven minutes left. So before any more time elapses, I just want to let everyone know that's, that's here in the room with us, that you will find links in the post when I post this uh, interview on Instagram, on Instagram, you will find the links. I'm going to have Tim, your links to your Twitter and Instagram. It'll be, you know, which is at Tim Dillinger, um, yeah. Tim Dillinger Music on Facebook. Of course, we're going to have the Substack, Substack link for God's Music is My Life. Also, some other links to where um, folks can find your music and your book. We didn't even get to talk about one of your books, which was a memoir, The, the Road Home. The Road Home to You, yeah. Yeah, The Road Home to You. Oh, do you have, have it there it. to grab real quick so we can show people? Where is it? I thought I had it out here. Here it is. And talk a little bit in these in these last few minutes, talk a little bit about the, the mem so this is your memoir, The Road Home to You, and talk a little That's bit right. about that. Well, it's really written out of that 2012 um, health crisis that I had, and I journaled through that experience. And so I, uh, a few years after that, was just revisiting those writings, and, and uh, I thought, wow, it's not that I was actually pretty coherent to have been on that much uh, prednisone. Um, <laughs> and so I thought, 
it's a story I'd love to share because it really is about death and rebirth mm -hmm. and the experience of complete surrender to, you know, I couldn't walk, you know, for mm -hmm. a period. I was completely incapacitated mm -hmm. and, you know, allowing it, not fighting it, but mm -hmm. allowing it and then allowing something new because I was changed in that experience. And so really the road home to you is about that, just mm -hmm. the rebirth uh, and revisioning of really our lives. We all have that power mm -hmm. to do that. And so it's that story. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, it's the easiest way. I think it's on Barnes and Noble too, but. I think I have Amazon. the link. We'll have the link to Amazon there. Um, and I want everyone to follow you on Instagram for, for another reason too. Um, your babies, your oh. babies. There, I, do, I mean, there's, I know, I think I remember everybody's name. <laughs> Okay, that, that, that is that epic. Is that epic? That's epic. Okay, because I know there's epic and then there's Olivia. Yes. And then I think I hear the other baby in the background. Grace is, yeah, they're all riled up. There's people outside and the whole thing. Like, okay. Well, people have to follow you on Instagram just to be able to see the adorable pictures of uh, Grace, Epic, and Olivia that you post as well, just capturing them living their best lives in various moments, which is beautiful, which is beautiful. So, Tim, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. Um, everyone, again, thanks so much for joining us on, the, on this uh, episode of Frederick Johnson and Conversation. And once it's posted, go to those links, go to Substack, uh, read this current week's issue uh, about Tremaine Hawkins and uh, the search is over. Uh, and also subscribe to the newsletter and you'll find links for everything else all related to Tim Dillinger there as well. So Tim, thank you again. I'm wishing you all the best thank in you. 2021 and continued success with everything and have a wonderful summer. And thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Truly, this has been a delight, a delight. It has been. Alrighty, take care and thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you next time. Bye everybody.